Wow. Thank you, Elaine. And uh, thank you all for being here today. It, it, it's such an honor to have you at our modern campus, our headquarters. Uh, thank you all. Um, this has been a long time coming. And today we're launching a revolutionary technology that is going to change the way we farm. Making farms more profitable, making us as farmers more independent, all while protecting our planet's biodiversity, the farm microbiome, the soil microbiome, the farm biology. And I really quickly, Elaine alluded to this, I wanna thank all the farmers here today. Uh, and, and all the, the broadness of farmers, not just the wine growers, but the orchard growers from citrus and nuts to all of our fruit and vegetable farmers. Thank you guys all for being here. It means the world. Uh, I thought that I would share my family story and the perspective and how I got involved in this technology, this brilliant technology company. I'm a farmer and a winemaker first. My family's been farming now in this beautiful state, in this beautiful country for just over 100 years. Uh, my great-grandfather, Cesare, and my great-grandmother, Rosa, got us into the wine business when they immigrated from Italy. My grandfather, Robert, took us to the next level. My uncle, Michael, who is here, my father, Tim, my aunt, Marcy, continue to rise. And I thought that I would talk, because we measure climate in wine. When we enjoy a great bottle of wine, we talk about the site, we talk about the team, the domain, and then we talk about the variable. The variable is climate. Was it a good year? Was it a challenging year? Did it rain all growing season? Were you able to ripen your fruit? Was it too hot? When you look at wine, we perspire acidity through the cell wall of the grape. So hot years, less acidity, more sunlight transfers to more photosynthesis equals richer, riper wines. Cooler years, you retain acidity. You don't get as much photosynthetic energy. Leaner, cr leaner crunchier, fresher, more vibrant wines. And so I thought it'd be fun to break up my family's 100 years into three different eras and talk about the climate impact of those three eras. So the first era is while my family was at Charles Krug. And just a little bit before, from 1919 to 1966, and just before that, in 1883, the very first coal power plant was built in Edison in London. And later on that decade, the very first combustion automobile, combustion engine automobile was built, Carl Benz from Mercedes-Benz Company, and that began the technology of the time, fossil fuel. So in this era, 50 years, we increased by 20 parts per million, roughly. So just a slight increase didn't actually affect change in us. And when you look at these era, this era, if you take a decade, we had maybe nine cool vintages and one warm vintage. So we would be thrilled about the warm vintage. The next era, while my family was at Robert Mondavi from 1966 until 2004, in this era it's about 40 years, and we increased by 70 parts per million. So 10 years fewer than the previous era, but really a big increase. In this era, it flips about nine warm vintages and one cool vintage. Climate change is affecting us, but had yet to really, really challenge us. In fact, I would say that this would be the golden era if the previous era was the era of elegance. Really, think about the, the decades of the 80s and the 90s, how beautiful those wines are. And then the era that we're in today, from 2004 until current day, this is the era where my grandfather Robert, my father Tim, my aunt Marcy began continuum, my uncle Michael began folio, my brother Dante and I went off on our own, we began rain. And then my wife is a farmer and winemaker from Italy. She has a great winery, but although we started a tiny farm for Sony de la Sola. In this era, it's about 17 years. And we've increased by 30 parts per million. It's, it's wow, we're now at 420 parts per million. And when you zoom out and you look at this from a macro perspective, this is a thousand years. If you want to go back 10,000 years, that line is very, very steady very even for the last previous, so not the last 100 years, but 9,900 years before that. And that steady climate allowed for us as humanity to thrive, it allowed for us to grow our civilization and have great reliance on being able to produce foods. And so when you look at this last era I was talking about previously, the era that we're in today, that decade, so if you take since 2012 to current day, we're not having nine warm vintages and one cool vintages, or nine cool vintages and one warm vintage. 
we're seeing vintages like in 2017 or 2015 where my family lost half of our crop due to drought before set. 2017, my family lost 30% of our crop due to wildfire. The wildfires came back in 2020, this time much more catastrophic than earlier. Dante and I lost 65% of our crop at rain, and my family lost 100% of our crop at continuum. We won't be making a bottle of continuum in 2020. And then this last vintage, and this is, this rain, we're so blessed to have this rain, you guys. We are now in our third year. Thank you guys for making it out in the rain. Let's go. Um, this is the third consecutive driest year that we've had since 1896. We are in a massive drought. So this rain is much appreciated. This last, last harvest, my, my family lost half of our crop due to drought or set. So we've had now four catastrophic years in a decade. So wine or, or climate change doesn't just affect the quality of our crop, it affects our ability to have a crop. And it doesn't just affect our crop, it affects our community. This is in the town of Santa Rosa in Sonoma in 2017. 900 homes burnt in a matter of hours. All firefighters could do was literally knock on doors and say, get out. The winds were too fierce, it was too dry and too hot. It was terrifying. So this affects our communities, our friends, our loved ones. My family feels lucky, even though we've lost so much of our crop, we still have our winery, we still have our house. We can't say the same for many of our friends. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so there we go. So I want to shift topics and talk really quickly about our, our planet. Um, I want to talk about plant biodiversity. Our farmlands are national treasures, and currently, our agricultural landscape makes up twenty percent of our planet's greenhouse gas emissions and 50% of our planet's inhabitable land, and uses 70% of our water resources. When you think about that, look at California, for example. California is 100 million acres of land, of which 43 million of those acres are farmland. So what we put into our soils and what we do on our farmland affects everything. And today, as it stands, we use roughly 9 billion pounds of pesticides and 100 million tons of fertilizers. The most alarming thing about this number is the five billion pounds of herbicides. It's the one thing where you can have 100% reduction by mowing, or tilling, or crimping, or whatever fancy way you like to cut the grass, or you can use 100% of being able to spray chemicals. And so along my journey, prior to beginning Mom Tractor with my brilliant co-founders and this incredible team that we have, I started a challenge called the Monarch Challenge. And the Monarch Challenge was to create awareness within the farming community about these dangerous chemicals in agriculture. Because I know one thing that unites the most conventional farmer and the most organic farmer. And that one thing is that we all care deeply about our planet, we care deeply about our souls, we care deeply about our families. And so learning about the human health impact and learning about the environmental impact, I felt that if I just went out and talked to farmers, surely we'd be able to migrate away from these chemicals. The reason why it's called the Monarch Challenge is because since the introduction of Roundup, well, I can say in 1974, kind of as a flag in the ground, as an era of when we really began using more chemicals directly into our food ecosystem. Since this time in 74, the monarch population of butterflies has declined by 99% and they're now on the brink of extinction. Monarchs are now critically endangered. Okay? In fact, it's, it's pretty ironic and pretty incredible that we're launching this track in the same year that they got put on to the endangered species. It's well overdue, I think. And the three things that are harming the monarchs, migratory path disruption, climate change, and pesticides. And these are three things that we can address through our tractor. So the idea of the monarch challenge was to go out and talk with farmers. Because I knew that if we simply talked about it, then not one farmer would want to use these chemicals. And what I ended up running into was wall after wall. It was heartbreaking. It was one of the most impressive I've ever been. The first challenge was that there was economic divide. I would talk to families and they would literally say, we didn't know about this, but I've got to put food on my table for my family, I've got to put my kids to college. I quickly learned there was an economic divide. And I quickly learned that 45% of the farms in America were not profitable. And globally, family, 80% of the farms around the world are family and not So with a tear in their eye, they said, we have to figure this out, but the chemicals right now are more effective, more efficient for us. 
And then I would talk to other farmers and they'd say, yeah, we realize herbicides are not ideal. We realize that synthetic systemics are not ideal. But right now, if I want to go down the organic route, I have to turn my compact tractor on and drive it more often. And turning on one compact tractor the size of Monarch, a diesel, is like turning on 14 cars. And it's NOx, particulate, and CO2, which is a classical carcinogen. So these farmers would say to us, look, we agree it's not ideal, but I want to protect the climate, and it cost me a lot less to do that. So we were in this really, really terrible area where there was a carbon footprint divide and an economic divide separating protecting the planet's biodiversity. I, I realized that if we are going to survive and thrive as a human species, we have to make what is best for our planet economically superior to anything else. And that's when I got the introduction of a lifetime to my co-founders, three brilliant engineers at Silicon Valley, and we began our track route. So I want to talk, I'll try to put two pieces together, but I'd like to talk about how our tractor is go going to solve the modern challenge of so much more. By being all electric, we're able to bridge away from the fossil fuel era, and even when hooked up to the grid, there's a, a major impact in savings on the carbon footprint. But the beautiful thing about this is that we're able to bridge from the fossil fuel era and into a renewable era of farming. When you think about the 43 million acres of farmland in California, we have so much abundance of wind, of geothermal, of hydro, of solar. We can now get into the renewable energy business. We can basically take all of the same energy that's growing our crops, store that energy in our batteries, and deploy that later on. We actually can come into the energy business. 10 modern tractors is a mega buy. That's a microgrid. We can now solve on the edge energy solutions for rural areas. By being all electric, we're helping take a big piece out of that carbon footprint that is hurting the market of the Driver optional, the tractor is just like a normal tractor. You can get in it and you can drive it. So it does twice the floor, it's all electric, so it's much smoother than diesel, and it's not loud, I believe. But it's also autonomous. By the way, it also has all the same hookups so on the back end, your PTL, your three-point hitch, your hydraulic pump. So it marries our implement yard as we have it today. It's perfectly in. By being autonomous, there's two major factors here. The first is that it takes us as farmers out of the most dangerous place in the farm, which is the tractor seat. Even spraying organic chemicals, you have to wear a hazmat seat. And doing that six, seven, eight hours a day is very, very, very laborious and very difficult. So it allows for us to elevate ourselves and become fleet managers away from even these organic chemical sprays, period. The other piece is that by being autonomous, so every single winter, the monarchs begin to congregate out on the coast. They're congregating right now, and they form these kaleidoscopes where they basically cause a hibernate. And then in the spring, when all the grasses are growing and this rain has been absorbed and flowers are popping and all the other cocoons and insects are starting to come to life and the baby birds are being born, we have a decision to make as farmers. How, what are we going to deal with? How are we going to deal with these grasses? Are we going to mow these grasses? Are we going to crunk the grasses? Are we going to till them? Or are we going to spray herbicide? The exciting thing about being autonomous is now you can go out and be more detailed. You can mow as much as you need to mow without the economic divide or the carbon footprint divide. On top of that, this is a little sidebar. Since the Russia-Ukraine war, around the glyphosate has gone from $25 a gallon to $75 a gallon. All the fertilizers, all these petrol-based chemicals have absolutely tripled in, in cost, if not more. So it's becoming cost prohibitive. I have a friend who has a farm about 4,500 acres in Lodi. We calculated that he spends about $2.2 million a year on herbicide. $2.2 million a year. By being able to be autonomous, we save him from that chemical, and we save our soils from that chemical. We save our planet's biodiversity and health from that chemical. And so as the monarchs make their way into their migratory path, they're no longer being hit with all those herbicides that are being sprayed spray in the spring. This is a big deal. So autonomy is going to help us there. Data-driven, there's a great McKinsey and company study that said that by 2050, farms will be 70% more productive. With Monarch, we won't be just more productive. We're vision stacks, we absorb all this data. We'll be more productive, we'll be cleaner, we'll be greener. So today, I'm super excited, you guys. We are embarking on a journey to help us as farmers become more profitable, more productive, and help our planet's biodiversity. So I want to thank you. Thank you, Elaine, for everything.